Good morning. I'm going to call to order this regular meeting of the Zoning and Planning Committee for Thursday, December 5th. My name is Jeremy Schrader and I'm the chair of this committee. With me at the dais are Councilmember Ellison, Councilmember Wright, and Councilmember Goodman. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum. We've got nine items on today's agenda, including a public hearing, a quasi-judicial hearing, uh, three discussion items, uh, but we'll first handle the consent agenda, which is items number three through six. Number three is an alley vacation application submitted by North Central University. Number four is several rezoning and vacation applications submitted by the Family Partnership. Number five is the uh, several appointments to the Arts Commission. And number six is a local his historic landmark designation for the Oakland Apartments. Is there any of these discussion items um, or anything that the committee members like to pull anything off? Councilmember Goodman? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to comment on item number six. Thank you. Go ahead. So um, this morning we're going to be taking action to approve the landmark designation of the Oakland Apartments. And first of all, I, I don't see anyone from the Oakland Apartments here, but I do want to thank John Smoley, Aaron Hanauer, Steve Poor, and all of the people in the planning department who have been working with John and Norm on this building. I'll just remind my committee colleagues and members of the audience that we weren't sitting here more than a year ago when the application to demolish this building was in front of us. And this was the one where Public Works said, eh, it's a fire hazard, it should be demolished, and planning said it's, it, it's a potentially worthy of historic designation, but no one will rehab it, and the cost will be too high, and the problems will be too great, and it's worth saving, can you find somebody? And um, John and Norm, who have saved another house in my ward at 300 Clifton, uh, came in and are working to save this building. What's incredible about it is, although they've had some challenges with the construction of the building, they still are moving forward with landmark designation. So despite the conflict that they've had with building officials and others, they still believe in the value of the designation. They've restored historic um, uh, stained glass windows. They have uh, done some incredible work over there. I think everyone who's been involved in it knows that. And very rarely do owners of buildings in the middle of construction come to us and say, we care so much about this landmark designation that we're going to move forward with it. So it's just really a huge deal, not just in my ward, but for the whole city. Um, if you are interested, you can contact uh, Mr. Smalley about it. But it's one of the remaining buildings of its kind in a district where there were rows of buildings like this. And so um, I'm sure we'll all be included in an opening when it happens. Right now they've enclosed the structure and they're working on HVAC and they might have heat in the building and electricity is moving through it and this building will be brought back to life. And oh, by the way, it's going to be 24 units of naturally occurring affordable housing. So they could have done it into six luxury flats. Instead, they're doing 24 smaller affordable units to bring it back to what it was uh, in its last iteration. So it's a really proud day for um, our office and I know the planning department, the city, and John and Norm, I'm kind of shocked they're not here. They probably thought this wasn't a big deal. Uh, whereas, the, whereas the heritage preservation designation was the bigger deal. But um, it's just really overwhelming emotionally to see it happen. So thank you for being able to allow me to point it out. And a, just a special thank you to John and Aaron and Steve Poor and the others on the staff who have really done yeoman's work on this. Thank you. And, and also, Council Member, thank you for your work on this as well. Yeah. Also, let the record reflect, we've been joined by Council Member Gordon. Um, is, it's not seeing any other discussion. Um, I will move all of the consent agenda. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. The ayes have it, and that motion carries. Next, we're going to move on to item number one, is an application submitted by Hennepin County uh, Facility Services for an interim use permit. I've, informed this by the, I've been informed by the staff uh, that the applicant has been requested a continuance of this application for, uh, to allow more discussion with the community on the operation of the proposed emergency shelter. As uh, notices were sent out for this public hearing, uh, we do need to open it up. Um, and give anyone here today the opportunity to speak to the issue and address the committee. Uh, when we're done, I will not close the public hearing, but I'll rather continue it to our next meeting, which will be on January 9th of next year, 2020. Uh, 2020. I will now open the hearing. Uh, would anyone like to speak to item number one? Anyone interested in speaking? Not seeing anyone, I'll now move to continue the public hearing to our January 9th meeting. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The ayes have it and the motion carries. 
Item number two is a consideration of an appeal by Dalton Scott regarding the Zoning Board of Adjustments denial of two variances for a new detached accessory dwelling unit for the property located at 1309 5th Street Northeast and we'll begin with the staff presentation. Morning Chair, committee members. Again, the item before you is an appeal of the decision of the Zoning Board of Adjustment. The board denied two variance requests associated with the construction of a new detached accessory dwelling unit. <clears throat> the first variance requested was to increase the maximum permitted gross floor area from 676 square feet to 774 square feet. The second variance was to increase the maximum permitted height from 20 feet to 21.5. <clears throat> This parcel is just over 5,500 square feet and is flat. A duplex exists on the front of the site and there is surface parking to the rear. The applicant is proposing, again, a structure that measures 774 square feet on the second floor as well as 21.5 feet to the peak of the flat roof. There is a green roof associated with this, so the applicant did need a little bit extra room to make that work, and that is the need for that height uh, variance request. Again, when issuing variances, several findings must be met. The first finding is a practical difficulty has to exist on the site. So when looking at a standard size lot that's flat, is there a reason that the new proposed detached accessory dwelling unit cannot comply with that 676 square foot maximum or the 20 foot maximum to the peak height. Staff is unable to make any of those variance findings. The next, the property owner is proposing to use the property in a reasonable manner. Again, <clears throat> staff cannot make these findings. Uh, the intent of code is to regulate the built environment. This is a new structure. It's a flat lot, standard size. The design of this structure is creating the need for this variance, or both variances. And last, the essential character of the area may be disrupted with the issuance of these variances. In regulating height, in exceeding 20 feet, we may be increasing shadowing on adjacent properties. Uh, increasing that 676, we're creating a structure that's significantly larger than a structure that may be built next door that would comply with all of the ordinances. So with that, staff recommends upholding the decision of the board. I'll be here for questions. The applicant is also present. Thank you. Uh, not seeing any questions. Also, let the record reflect that we've been joined by the council president. Thank you. At this point, I'll open the public hearing. I'll open the hearing, and I'll first give the appellant the opportunity to speak. Uh, is Mr. Scott here, or is there a representative that would like to speak? You can just come forward and say your name and address for the record. Yep, my name is Dalton Scott. Address is 1309 Fifth Street Northeast. Thank you very much for taking the time today. Um, so I, I understand that my lot is pretty standard. Um, so when we were designing this, um, there's a couple different elements into going into why I wanted to appeal this decision and, and bring it before you guys. Um, the first one is around the cloudiness of the code right now, and I, I totally understand that this is something that's new, accessory dwelling units. Um, so there is going to be some uh, back and forth that goes into it. Uh, we had multiple design iterations on, on this, and each time we iterated on the design, we hit a new or seemingly new roadblock um, with this code, uh, particularly with the footprint of the area, as footprint is, um, is defined. Uh, our original thought and the thought that was communicated to us was that the footprint of a building is, is kind of what's on the ground of, of the of the unit. Um, the actual footprint in that definition is well below the allotted footprint area. It's a little over 600 square feet if you count in the 
stairwell, stairwell landing um, with this. Uh, so the the things that we really ran up against with this design were the the overhang of the second floor and then the exterior stairwell to get into the dwelling unit. Um, that's really what put us over that that limit. And if you eliminate the exterior stairwell and the and the um, landing, we're almost right there, if not just a couple square feet over uh, with that overhang. So the actual like garage that's sitting on the ground, that's 600 square feet. Um, the reason why we did the, the overhang over the second, um, over the garage is to make this a livable dwelling unit. Um, a lot of accessory dwelling units that have been built to date are kind of office like spaces, um, pretty hard to live in spaces unless you're into living in a micro into a micro unit um, so we wanted to make something that was actually livable i personally am going to be moving over to this and i'm going to be turning my unit into housing um, long-term rental housing so that's that's really what i've been trying to do with this i've gotten approval from the majority of my neighbors as well as my neighborhood council um, they really like this because um, the the stats are 60 percent of accessory dwelling units turn into affordable housing that aren't subsidized or anything like that it's it's developed affordable housing from neighbors this is keeping our neighborhood looking similar um, and the really cool thing about this structure is I did add a parking spot for every unit. Um, if we were to move the stairwell inside, which is arguably the easiest way to make this uh, conforming, um, and it makes it a nicer experience for myself because I don't have to go up and down the stairs in the winter. Uh, the problem with that is if we put that inside, we're gonna have to eliminate a parking space and it eats up like somewhere in the 70 to 100 square foot of livable space upstairs. So it's taking an already small unit, it's making it a lot smaller just for you know moving a stairwell inside. So I opted to have the, the worst stairwell in our winters um, to increase livability and add another parking space. Um, in my neighborhood, parking is uh, increasingly becoming an issue, and it's definitely an issue that the neighborhood council cares about. Um, as for the height portion of this building, really we're, we're asking for an additional foot and a half because I'm putting a, a real green roof on the top of this. Um, this won't be a tray system. This is going to be somewhere between six inches and a foot worth of dirt on top of the building. It drastically increases the R value. It's going to be a much more sustainable building. I'm putting wild pollinator habitat up there. Um, so it's going to be a bee friendly haven. It's going to absorb the rainwater runoff. Um, currently there's a parking pad there so I'm actually increasing the permeable space on my property by approximately 700 square feet with this. So it's going to drastically soak up a lot more of the rainwater. Um, definitely going to be a little bit more expensive, I know that, and that's that's part of like what I want to put into this. Um, additionally, with this, and I apologize, my designer had an emergency and couldn't come today, so I'm working off my phone. Um, but I just wanted to show here this diagram right there. If you can see that, these three buildings right here are, th this is a traditional um, conforming, Thank you, whoever zoomed in for me. <laughs> um, so the one on the right is a traditional conforming roof. The one in the center is a flat conforming roof. And the one on the left is, is my proposed roof. So you can see that like I'm, I'm drastically under what the peak of a traditional roof would be anyway um, with the flat roof because uh, you, you take the midline of, of the traditional peak. So that's something I wanted to point out to you in terms of shadowing and stuff is like this is going to be um, a better design for that just because um, it is going to be shorter. Additionally, with the, um, the layouts, this is kind of just highlighting like what a layout could be that's conforming and, and my layout of the top floor. Um, what's, what's neat about my design here is you can see these two little dashed areas on either side. It's kind of hard to see with my phone. Um, but essentially, I've, I've put two green roofs along the edges of this building as well. It, it steps back from the bottom floor. So that's additional space that like if we were to bump out and make this 
a up down rectangle sure it would it would be easier to conform but these additional green roofs are going to add aesthetic value for both of my neighbors and the alleyway on both sides um, just additional wildflower habitat i'm really trying to make something that's sustainable and and really beautiful and is something that's totally different than um, what a lot of design is doing right now um, yeah in terms of fitting in with the neighborhood i, I don't think that's a super valid point um, there aren't a lot of flat roofs in my neighborhood so I could see that being something that doesn't quite fit in but we live in the arts district like there's a lot of weird stuff that happens in, in Sheridan neighborhood like that's the point right <laughs> so like I'm trying to make something that's really aesthetically pleasing that's beautiful for my neighbors and beautiful for uh, the environments as well um, do you guys have any questions and I'm not seeing it. I just, my, one of my questions, I, I want to thank you for all the work you're doing to make a green roof. And uh, I, thought, I appreciate the thoughtfulness. I do have a question just about the height. Like it, mm -hmm. um, if you went through many iterations of the design, mm -hmm. um, this is a foot and a half over, could you have dropped some of the, the height in some of the other two floors? Or why would that be an issue? So, so throughout the iterations, our height actually never changed. Um, something that was communicated through the process and actually um, was, was that this is something that the city would like to see. I know that there was an initiative to have like 150 green roofs by 2015 or something like that through the sustainable initiative. And I'm not, I, from, from what my research, I don't think we met that. Um, so I know this is something that we want and, and that we want to see the reducing the, the floors within the other two. Um, it's probably possible on in the garage the the one thing that I guess I didn't mention that I want to do with the garage is still have it to be a habitable conforming height so that if in the future we don't need cars or renters don't need cars that could potentially be turned into a larger unit for living space or potentially even another unit of affordable housing so I'm, I'm trying to future proof this building in a way that's really sustainable um, Additionally, the height question from what I've heard has come up multiple times from people who are building ADUs. So this is something that I also, I talked to my council member Fletcher about and um, we are hoping that even by just bringing it forward, this kind of like helps move the needle to make accessory dwelling units even more accessible and, and usable for people. It's a little extra height. Great, thank you. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. I'm now gonna open the hearing to the members of the public. Um, anyone that would like to speak to the committee, uh, please limit your comments to two minutes, which will be tracked by the clock uh, by the clerk. Would any members of the public like to speak? If you can just come up and say your name and address for the record. My name is Julie Speed, and I live at 2837 30th Avenue South. Um, council Member Gordon is my council person, and I met with him on Monday, and I think he's got a proposal in for increasing the height of ADUs. Now, I don't know what the proposition might be, um, but I do feel like um, it's a really good thing for our city, and I do feel like uh, we adopted ADUs before we adopted our 2040 comprehensive plan, and so we're playing a little bit of catch up to go back to um, revise some of our ADU regulations and policies to match where we want to be with 2040. I think if someone wants to spend the kind of money he's talking about spending on a really beautiful building and minimizing the um, environmental impact, that, that's huge for our city because we're losing trees and our storm drains are incredibly overflowing. Um, and so I really appreciate his thoughtfulness with that. Um, so I want to let that be known as well. And adding a unit is huge. We are short 30,000 units in our city. And I think um, just one unit is not going to make a huge dent. But if we can get more owner investors to commit to projects like this, we can slowly chip away. And it's, I think, an important piece to the puzzle. Thank you. Anyone else interested in speaking? Anyone else? Seeing no one, I'm going to close the hearing. Uh, Councilmember Rake. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I think the points were well made, and it's rather consistent with an intentional project we did where we really were trying to push the envelope for future structures in the name of environmental sustainability um, and the build form that we contemplate in our current comprehensive plans. Uh, this might not have been an intentional partnership, but you uh, intuitively uh, struck a lot of our policy cords, not where we necessarily are at now, but where we're going uh, from a technical evaluation standpoint. And I think when we have minimal trade-offs in the name of our environmental goals, that's where we want to be. And of course, I know staff is diligently doing our pilot projects like we did in Wake Park, taking examples like this where we might make some compromise in the name of our future goals uh, to heart and codify that. So in some ways, you are part and parcel of our advancement. And so with that, I'm happy to move this item uh, in favor of the um, um, applicant. Thank you. Councilmember Goodman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I support this. I'm going to try to give you a practical difficulty. It's as the kind of leader of the green roof movement at the city for many, many years, I think that having a green roof on this building is a top priority. And if they were to have a, the, pitch, the allowed pitched roof, which would be allowed under the code, they couldn't have the green roof. So the practical difficulty, in my opinion, would be that they, uh, we want them to put in a green roof and they can't both meet the pitched roof standard and the flat roof height for the green roof. So I believe the practical difficulty is the environmental consideration with regard to adding the green roof. What do you think of that, Councilmember Gordon? We're sitting here trying to come up with a practical difficulty. That seems like one. Because he showed us, and I thought that was a good argument, actually, that he could have had a peaked roof that was taller and met the code. Um, so I, I wouldn't probably encourage staff to be coming up with practical difficulties like this, but it seems in an appeal and the really well done presentation we had from the applicant, that seems like a legitimate practical difficulty. Councilmember Gordon. I don't think I'm going to discuss that at all because <laughs> I don't know that we have to analyze it a whole lot. I just wanted to... Um, call out that I think this is a great example for us to take into consideration as we're amending the ordinance and we're going forward in the future. Um, so this is a good lesson for all of us to remember the discussion, the meeting, the priorities, what the policymakers were thinking and, and how important is pitched consistency with flat roofs and not. And um, I think it's, it's it, it was a little challenging for me to c come up with the necessary findings, so I really appreciate the extra effort that my colleagues have put into that. Thank you. Um, not seeing any other, my, uh, I don't have anything to add to the great conversation from my colleagues. I'll just ask the city attorney to kind of draft findings, uh, assuming this vote goes a certain way. Uh, with that, uh, Councilmember Reich's motion is before us. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The ayes have it, and that motion carries. Um, with that, we're going to move on to our discussion agenda. Um, number seven is an ordinance amending occupancy regulations, and we'll begin with a brief staff presentation. <clears throat> Good morning, Chair Schrader, committee members. Uh, the purpose of the occupancy regulations amendment uh, is to add flexibility to the residential dwelling unit occupancy regulations. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, currently, occupancy is regulated in both the zoning code and the housing maintenance code. Uh, in the zoning code, uh, occupancy is regu regulated by a definition of family, as well as the number of unrelated persons. In the housing maintenance code, uh, it's regulated by a definition of family as well, slightly different than the zoning code definition, and the total square footage of the dwelling unit in each sleeping room. Um, the intents are slightly different for the zoning code. Uh, the idea is to maintain the residential character of certain areas of the city, whereas in the housing maintenance code, it is to ensure the health, safety, and welfare of residents. There are some issues with the current zoning um, occupancy regulations. Uh, first of all, the definition of family doesn't recognize um, uh, certain household types with unrelated persons. Um, among, <clears throat> sorry about that. Among peer cities, um, it's not typical for them to at least recognize some number of unrelated persons as a family or a household. Uh, also, um, the maximum occupancy 
is determined by the number of unrelated persons. Um, occupancy regulations apply to all districts where uh, <coughs> residential uses are allowed. Uh, the lowest density districts are the most restrictive. Um, but there is no, should be noted that there's no limit on the number of related persons that could live together. Uh, there's also no authorized variance of the occupancy regulations. Um, having occupancy regulations in the zoning code has resulted in a significant amount of staff time being spent on processing requests for reasonable accommodation under the Federal Fair Housing Amendments Act. Under this act, the persons with disabilities seeking fair and equal access to housing have to request modifications or waiving of zoning regulations. Um, all of our, almost all of our uh, reasonable accommodation requests are related to occupancy and that comes out to about 20 or so a year. Um, for each of these requests we have to write lengthy reports and then all, almost all these uh, requests are approved. So this involves a significant amount of staff time for something that's allowed. Uh, there are some additional reasons for the amendment. Um, Starting with, there are residential structures in the city that could safely accommodate additional occupants than what the zoning code allows. As far as best practices go, occupancy is best addressed in housing and uh, building codes. And the zoning code should um, is better at regulating uses than users. Uh, it's also an impediment to fair housing choice. Uh, I will get into more background about that in a bit. Uh, in both the current and our new comprehensive plan, uh, we have policies that call for removing housing barriers. And um, given the recent growth trends in the city and the need to provide additional housing op uh, options to accommodate that growth and the low vacancy rate in recent years, um, this amendment is very timely. So. Uh, the Minneapolis zoning occupancy regulations were identified as an impediment to fair housing choice by the addendum to the 2014 regional analysis of impediments to fair housing. Uh, this was a report prepared by the Fair Housing Implementation Council and it was required of communities that receive certain funds from the Department of Housing and Urban Development. It's a regional study that included 22 metro area cities and in light of the addendum's findings, the city is required to examine its land use and zoning policies and take appropriate actions to ensure that our policies are furthering fair housing. Within the report, there were uh, three specific recommendations to change the zoning code. Um, and this amendment addresses two of the three um, listed on the slide. First, amending the definition of family to more closely correlate <laughs> to neutral maximum occupancy regulations found in safety and building codes. And secondly, to increase the number of unrelated persons who may reside together to better allow for non-traditional family types. So within the amendment, um, it would include eliminating the zoning district maximum occupancy requirements, removing other references to those uh, district requirements, and then lastly, amending the definition of family to refer to the housing maintenance code definition, and that's to um, prevent any inconsistencies between the two codes. At the Planning Commission, um, they recommended approval of the amendment. It was approved on consent. Uh, and. Uh, with the adoption of this amendment, we would still, of course, have the Housing Maintenance Code occupancy regulations. Um, there was a, an amendment introduced um, for the occupants, or Housing Maintenance Code um, about the same time that the Zoning Code amendment was introduced. It's expected that we'll go forward in the near future and include an amendment to their definition of family. Uh, that concludes my presentation. I can take questions. Thank you. I'm not seeing any questions. Moving on to the Council and President Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to move this item forward and thank you all for your support. We've been working on this and talking about it for a number of years. This is another legacy of exclusionary zoning that had sought to, um, I think really, as staff described, um, limit and decide who can live together and who can't through zoning. And I don't think this form of um, you know, dictating people's living arrangement belongs in our zoning code. And in fact, this is one of the steps that was recommended to us um, through complying with federal fair housing. So I'm excited that we got this point next year. Um, the, uh, the related amendment will come through the EDRS committee um, with the help of Council Member Goodman. So I look forward to get finishing this up uh, early next year. And again, thanks for all your support. Thank you. 
not seeing any other discussion, uh, the council president's motion is before us. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The ayes have it and that motion carries. Item number eight is an ordinance uh, amending regulations related to inclusionary zoning and we'll begin with a staff presentation. Good morning, Chair Schrader, Council Members. We are uh, before, staff is before you today to discuss the permanent inclusionary zoning ordinance and amendment to the existing interim regulations. Uh, the proposed changes will occur in the zoning code in chapters uh, 530 site plan review and chapter 535 regulations of general applicability. In addition to those two chapters, um, uh, the notice of introduction included chapters 520 and 525. Staff is recommending returning those back to the author this morning. On September 27, 2019, Council Member Schrader and Council President Bender introduced uh, subject matter to amend our current uh, inclusionary zoning or housing ordinance. Um, inclusionary housing is intended to promote affordable housing and to fulfill the city's housing policy goals by ensuring moderately priced housing is provided within a mixed income development. In 2017, the city engaged with uh, consultant Grounded Solutions Network to conduct a financial feasibility analysis and policy research regarding national best practices uh, to inform recommendations for both the unified housing policy and the city zoning ordinance to implement inclusionary zoning in the city. Last year, just about a year ago, on December 7th, the City Council approved uh, the updates to the Unified Housing Policy and the Zoning Code to reflect uh, an interim strategy to uh, capture projects um, shortly, that were coming in shortly after the uh, initial review of the, the Minneapolis 2040 plan. So during that time, we had a total of five projects that would have been subject to inclusionary zoning Two were exempt because they already were seeking some other additional city subsidy. Uh, one was uh, a smaller, or one was uh, exempt because it was a condominium project. Um, there was one small scale development project that uh, had seven residential units that would be subject to inclusionary zoning. And then at our last planning commission meeting on November 18th, uh, there was another proposal uh, that would trigger the inclusionary zoning. Uh, the, the land use applications were approved at planning commission and then the, the full um, council will review um, the proposed rezoning for that project in 2020. In early 2019, the city conducted a request for a proposal again and engaged with Ground Solutions Network uh, to assist in the development of the permanent inclusionary policy and zoning uh, program. So yesterday at our housing and policy and development meeting, the uh, Ground Solutions Network presented policy recommendations that will be uh, reflected in the unified housing policy. So today we're here to discuss the, the changes in the, in the zoning code. Uh, again, just reminding the goals of the proposed text amendment is to ensure that uh, production and feasibility are not uh, compromised with providing affordable housing on site. To encourage mixed income communities, because again, the intention of using this tool is to take what would otherwise be a market rate development and um, in add moderately priced affordable units uh, that are accessible to uh, individuals or families of lower income. And then also for uh, simplicity and for implementation. So the zoning code uh, presently allows for um, a development capacity analysis to trigger inclusionary zoning. Um, that will be uh, struck from the existing ordinance and instead inclusionary zoning will apply to dwellings um, in, either in a residential development or a mixed use development that have at least 20 dwelling units. Staff is proposing a phased in period to allow for the market to adjust to these new recommendations. So what we will be doing as a staff is calculating buildings that come in, again, either residential or mis mixed use with units between 20 and 49 units. And once we receive uh, 
once building permits are issued for up to 500 units in buildings of those sizes, then we will kick off a six month time period for which at that, the expiration of that six months, the, um, the threshold will be solidified at 20 dwelling units. It's written this way into the zoning ordinance, so there will be no need to come back before committee for an ordinance amendment. Um, 20 units is what the zoning code says, and then the phased in um, is also written in as well. So this would be specifically for the rental requirement. Similarly, the zoning ordinance recognizes a phase in approach for ownership. Um, this was presented yesterday by Stephanie Reyes from Grounded Solutions Network that uh, based on our limited experience recently with condominiums, either new or conversions, um, we're planning to implement a phased in approach. So there will be no um, recommend or no uh, inclusionary zoning requirement until at least 500 units have been permitted in six months passes at 4% uh, of the units at 80% AMI for the first round and then once we hit on the next tier of a thousand units permitted then the uh, recommendation is to go to 8% of the units at 80% AMI. That concludes what I have before you today for the updates to the inclusionary zoning ordinance. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Not seeing any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Council President. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to move this. And we, you know, the Housing Committee kind of stole your thunder, but I do want to really um, thank the staff uh, in the zoning team for their work on this. And it was really a huge collaboration between the housing staff and the zoning staff. So thank you very much for that partnership. And I know we were balancing a lot of competing priorities in this ordinance. And so it really helped us ask a lot of really important questions about how, as our city grows, we can both support the kind of housing development that our constituents want to see, as well as make sure that the affordability is included. So I appreciate so much, again, the partnership and work working together. All right, well, not saying anything. I just have a couple words. Uh, did, again, just want to thank staff and all the stakeholders. This is a really complex and I think really thoughtful um, policy that's going forward. Um, I, I think like the council president talked about, this is really about balancing priorities and really we won't know what's going to happen until this passes. Um, and so I really, again, want to kind of thank the, the stakeholders that, that engaged with the city to come up with kind of a wide range of options. Um, one thing I'll be watching for is, uh, I found it very interesting, the LA study where they saw that they were able to produce um, deeper affordability um, where they were maybe, maybe got less units, uh, but they were able to get to kind of the lowest 30% AMI. So I encourage staff to look at, you know, as we talked about, this this isn't going to be the thing that's going to save us and find all the affordable housing, uh, this policy, but how does it fit in with all the other pro things that we're working on? Um, and if there's a way to maximize what we get out of this policy, we can adjust around that. Um, so with that, the council president's motion is before us. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The ayes have it and that motion carries. Finally, item number nine is the consideration of an appeal regarding the Planning Commission's denial of a site plan review for the project at 4159 Hiawatha Avenue. Uh, we held and closed the hearing at our last meeting on no in November, so I'll invite staff uh, up to update us on any progress and recommendations. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. Um, so this application was heard last on November 14th, um, and we were directed by council to uh, meet with the applicant again and discuss whether any compromises were available to the proposal here. So um, the application is for a new drive-through for Starbucks, and staff had recommended two conditions to limit left turns into and out of the site, um, and the applicant had appealed those two conditions. Uh, we did meet with uh, the applicant on November 21st. Um, it was myself and Alan from Public Works and discussed their proposal. Uh, however, the, the applicant is not comfortable with any proposal that does not allow left turns into and out of the site. Many of the proposals that they have shown in require increasing the length of the crossing distance and the width of the roadway, which we heard at the last zoning and planning committee meeting was not a, an acceptable solution. Um, staff is not able to support any of the designs that allow left turns into and out of the site, whether they widen the roadway or not. Um, so at this point, staff is still recommending approval with the conditions. Um, condition number nine, which uh, requires the applicant to design the curb cut to limit left turns into and out of the site. And condition number 10, 
which uh, requires the applicant to work with public works to limit left turns into and out of the site. Um, and, and from the staff perspective, a lot of that is just concerns about traffic and safety here. The additional um, peak demand for a, a coffee shop drive through use and uh, significant concerns about safety. Uh, in fact, the day that we met, November 21st, someone was hit and killed um, crossing at this intersection on foot. So those are really uh, kind of close to mind when it comes to this project. So um, I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I'm not seeing any questions. Thank you very much. So I'll ask the applicant to come up. This We had the public hearing already, um, so I will give the applicant three minutes just to respond um, and kind of go over anything. But the time will be carefully kept with the clock next to the clerk. Yeah, just let me pull up the presentation. I'm ready. Um, here to answer why did the city staff uh, add the conditions 9 and 10 after issuing a report with Autumn? Are they trying to prevent deaths and serious injuries according to Vision Zero? Or are they trying to stop a drive through and a, house, a development that doesn't have current housing or both? Um, you know, Vision Zero was adopted in 2017. 2018, we submitted the same plan with 43 apartments and conditions 9 and 10 were never a part of it. Um, if the staff is trying to prevent deaths and serious injuries, injuries uh, why aren't they prohibiting left-hand turns into and out of other sites? Um, why aren't they putting up medians and bollards right now on a whole bunch of other sites with, uh, with or without drive-throughs? Uh, why couldn't Public Works tell us of any other, ish, any other places where at our meeting where they, you couldn't do left-hand turns into and out of a site that they have recommended? We even asked them to send us a list afterwards. They couldn't, they haven't provided us with a list of where they've done that. Um, you know, the Hiawatha, our intersection is not prone to accidents. It's not, it's the low zone, lowest zone for um, traffic crashes. No one died at our intersection uh, that uh, uh, Lindsay uh, basically mentioned. Uh, so, and we were supposed to get together the postponement to, um, See if we can work out a solution. At the meeting, Alan said he's not going to accept any solution that doesn't have conditions nine and ten. So it's basically a non-starter. Our solution works. All we are asking for is to add 750 square feet of road. Um, and that Lindsay at the meeting said they have three votes in their favor. So basically, they weren't too willing to work out a solution in direct conflict of what you said. Um, in fact, they, Alan told us they had not done any traffic calculations. Uh, and uh, in, when they decided to add conditions 9 and 10. And uh, I even asked Alan if we did a full transportation demand management study. He wouldn't support it, even if it showed that the solution worked. Um, he disagrees with these numbers that Starbucks provided. I had Starbucks provide us a letter that says they are real numbers. Um, the examples they're using, the Starbucks on Snelling only stacks 11 to 12 cars, ours stacks 21 to the street. Lindale Avenue is way busier than 42nd Street. And if you look at the developments that have happened in the, uh, on Hiawatha Avenue, it's all happened around the light rail stations, one rehab into apartments. There's lots of mini storage. The site across the street from us was bought by U-Haul for more mini storage. And the vast majority of Hiawatha remains industrial which is why we're not proposing housing at this time, but we have it included in a later phase. And you get to decide the why as to why they added conditions nine and 10. And uh, I can't believe I got through it. Yeah, congratulations. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I'm just, I don't see any questions from my colleagues. Let's see if we have any discussion. Council Member Gordon. Yeah, you should have before you a couple of uh, conditions. Um, I still have grave concerns about this intersection. There definitely, according to the Star Tribune and all other indications and reports we have, there was a fatality because of a pedestrian accident recently. So I just want to defend staff in that comment. Appears to be accurate from all the research that um, I found. Um, I think that we, um, it's 
perfectly fine for us to get new information to study things more um, between some approval somewhere and some staff recommendation and that we have a council not only have um, the opportunity to be able to refine conditions and projects, but we also have a responsibility and an obligation. As should have been obvious to everybody at the last meeting, I have serious grave concerns about the traffic that will be happening, the peak conditions that happen here, um, and I um, think that we shouldn't be messing with left turns at this intersection. I think we've made mistakes in the past because we haven't thought about it more, and I think we can look to instances and complaints that we're getting in the past um, from projects that were approved where we didn't make this condition. And so I think it's it's great that we're flexible and nimble enough as a city to say we need to do more to make sure to prevent these kind of problems in the future as new projects come forward. So I would like to amend Condition 10 um, that would read, the applicant shall work with Public Works to modify the street design of 42nd Street to prohibit left turns into the site. That's removing the words if required. And also to add a Condition 11, the applicant shall obtain an approved transportation demand management plan prior to the issuance of any building permits or business licenses and shall maintain compliance with the plan for the life of the drive through including but not limited to providing traffic enforcement as deemed necessary. And I just would like to add those conditions on a separate vote before um, taking the next vote. Okay, I'm going to call on Councilmember Goodman and then we can take the vote on that. Um, thank you. I'm just wondering, Mr. Chair, if staff can explain to us under what conditions a TDM would be required. Now it feels like we're piling on and becoming more punitive, and I'll keep the rest of my comments to myself because I'm sure I'll be subpoenaed in court once they sue us over this. But I'm interested in, uh, for a drive through Starbucks, is that normally uh, when a TDM is required? Can you tell me what other drive through Starbucks or coffee shops had to do a TDM? Um, yeah, again, good morning, Chair, members of the committee. My name is Alan Klugman with Public Works, Traffic and Parking Services Division. A few comments on TDMP, Travel Demand Management Plan. Um, in ordinance, there's a square footage amount, 100,000 square foot of, or higher of commercial is a mandatory TDMP. Uh, we also have authority to do a discretionary TDMP um, when we feel traffic conditions or traffic concerns warrant one. Um, to the question of other drive-throughs, I'm just kind of going through my memory banks here. Um, we did have a study uh, done for the one that's at 47th and Cedar. Uh, we required an analysis for that. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not aware of other ones that have come more recently as standalone buildings. Sometimes they're part of a larger development that requires a TDMP. So if they're already going to be prohibited from having left turns, what would be the purpose of the traffic demand management plan? Yeah, exactly. Um, Chair and members of the committee, if we have a travel demand management plan, one of the things we focus on are the management strategies and the commitments by the applicant to manage, um, control and manage traffic. And so we can, through that vehicle, put additional conditions, um, for example, evaluation, monitoring, counting, observing, things like that. We can set triggers where if certain thresholds are met in terms of operational difficulties, then another set of mitigations needs to, um, uh, needs to be provided or executed, for example. I think uh, your text said, traffic enforcement or traffic control, some such words. So, so we Mr. could Klugman, put that into are you into anticipating the... with 21 spaces available for staging for cars that there's going to be a flood of like 100 cars and people are going to be backed up with the right turn only all the way down the street? Yeah, um, Chair and members of the committee, I think we're less concerned about, I think, what you're referring to, which maybe would be stacking and not having enough stacking on space and cars backing out into the public right away. I think what we're most concerned about is potentially I'll say problematic or difficult or unsafe movements if, for example, um, people were to try to violate the median and get around, if there were backups that we're not anticipating, um, if there's maybe neighborhood cut through traffic or some other thing that we haven't anticipated that we think could be ameliorated through some more active management. Those are the sorts of commitments we'd be looking for. Uh, we have done this in the past with other sites, for example, um, um, valet operations and things of the sort where we tie it to the business license so we have a bit of an enforcement mechanism. Once we sort of sign off on the site plan, there's some follow through with observation monitoring and then some almost prescribed what if steps that we would take if we see things happening. We sort of already anticipated that together with the applicant and come up with a strategy that we could then deploy six months out, 12 months out if we're seeing problems. 
Mr. Chair, I just have one more question. Um, when the applicant was proposing this larger housing project with and the Starbucks, so Starbucks plus a bunch of housing, you didn't require or ask for a TDMP then. How come? Sure. Uh, chair members of the committee, I uh, don't have the exact housing count in my head. I think it's 40 to 50. It's a rather modest housing count. So the traffic volumes, I'm just going to say, were largely the same. I just want to point that out. And I think the largest change is, um, as Council Member Gordon referred to, it's, I would say, some evolution and change of philosophy. Um, I know I spoke about this at the last meeting with an even increased emphasis on safety and ongoing safety operations at a site like this. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right, well, why don't we take a vote on uh, Council Member Gordon's motion uh, on the change of conditions. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. No. The ayes have it, um, and that motion carries. So now, is there any other discussion on the underlying consideration? All right, well, I just have a, a I think my one thing, I thank Alan for that explanation of the, the TDMP, because one of my concerns is if we were putting in some of these, how is that going to just change traffic? And I, that seems to answer that question very well for me. I will move. Um, I will move denial of the consideration. Um, all those in favor, say aye. I, oh, excuse me. Um, excuse me. I will move appeal with the added conditions. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed. No. The ayes have it, and that motion carries. Seeing no further business before the committee um, for this year, we are adjourned. Happy New Year, everybody.